What I'm hoping to do here is to uh, show you the anatomic structures from the lab on the normal abdominal CT. So here we have a contrast enhanced CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. You can see there's contrast in the vasculature including the heart and in the, abdom, uh, in the aorta. Uh, I'm displaying here the axial images and also the coronal reconstructions and I have included scalp lines so you can see where we are. So this slice on the axial would correspond to the topmost slice and as you scroll down you can see the localizer uh, or scalp line moving. Uh, so we're going to start with the gastrointestinal tract and so if you remember from the thoracic section we have the thoracic portion of the esophagus right here and uh, it continues inferiorly uh, to empty into the stomach and where it empties into the stomach the first portion of the stomach is the cardia and uh, it's not really a well-defined area in the stomach by uh, radiographs or by CT uh, but it's where the uh, uh, squamosal uh, mucosa changes to columnar at the level of the z-line so it's the very beginning of the stomach here the next portion uh, that's up top is the fundus. So it's the very topmost kind of portion of the stomach. And you can see that well on the uh, coronal reformats here, the topmost portion uh, of the stomach. So this is the fundus. Uh, next is the body of the stomach. And so we would continue further down. And it's the main large portion of the stomach that holds, you know, ingested material. And you can see this patient probably ate fairly recently uh, and has uh, gas and uh, more solid material uh, dependently. From there uh, it empties into the antrum of the pylorus and uh, that's uh, this chamber right here. Uh, fairly well defined in this patient often uh, you, you can't tell it that well apart from the body of the stomach but this is the antrum of the pylorus uh, ingested material should then pass through the pyloric channel into the first portion of the duodenum or the duodenal bulb. And so here is the pyloric channel right here. And um, uh, we'll take a look at that on the coronal. And you will see the pylorus, the antrum of it, and then the pyloric channel emptying into the duodenum. The duodenum has four portions. The first one is the horizontal portion. You can see that here. And then from there on it should go uh, inferiorly. The second portion, right here, second portion. And you kind of follow the ingested material centrally outlined by the wall of the duodenum. From the second portion at the inferior aspect it should now go horizontal back to the patient's left. In the third portion and it crosses over uh, the aorta here between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery and this patient might have a little bit of a narrowing here which is why the uh, second portion of the duodenum is and proximal third portion is distended but anyway it passes anterior to the abdominal aorta uh, in a horizontal plane and from here it should go back up Okay, so we'll follow this, and it can be a little difficult to tell it apart from the adjacent bowel, but I believe this is the fourth portion of the duodenum. And now we're into the jejunum. Now the jejunum, uh, unless you have contrast in there or a lot of fluid, it's hard to follow the uh, intraluminal material throughout the whole course, uh, but uh, the majority of the uh, bowel in the left abdomen is going to be jejunum, uh, excluding the colon, which we'll get to soon. And it's going to transition uh, down uh, into the right lower quadrant, where most of the bowel is going to be ilium. Uh, and so that's kind of just a general view of the small intestines kind of looking at them. So most of the bowel on the right side is going to be ilium. Now from the ilium it's going to enter into the cecum through the ileocecal valve. And I often find it easiest to find um, the inferior aspect of the cecum which is uh, uh, right here. It has ingested material within it and uh, then finding where it connects to the 
ilium at the level of the ileocecal valve. And uh, it probably takes place right in this region. Uh, maybe a little difficult to see in this patient, but there's often a little bit of fat right at the ileocecal valve. So uh, things from the ileum is going to pass into the cecum, and uh, then it actually can go a little bit inferiorly down in the cecum. And it is at this level where the appendix attaches. And so you would uh, try to look for something attaching to it or look for a small tubular structure in this region. And I see that right here. So this is the appendix that has a little bit of gas in it. And the appendix uh, connects to the cecum down here. And then we'll follow the appendix as it dives down towards the pelvis in this patient and then disappears because it's a blind ending tube ingested material that continues into the cecum is then uh, moved superiorly and uh, through the ascending colon and we see the ascending colon here the right side and should come up close to the liver at which point it turns more horizontal at the level of the hepatic flexure then at the hepatic flexure it continues across in the way of the transverse colon up to the region of the spleen at the splenic flexure. From here it should descend, go down in the descending colon, descending colon, continuing down, and it will then take a somewhat of an usually an S-shaped uh, configuration down into the pelvis in the form of the sigmoid colon. So here we go. Sigmoid colon, down, diving down, and going posteriorly. When it reaches the posterior, margin, or posterior part of the pelvis here and it becomes straight, it is now the rectum and will continue down in the rectum all the way down to the anus. So that is the gastrointestinal tract. So next up is the hepatobiliary system and some of the venous structures. First up is the liver. So the liver is in the right upper quadrant of the, ab of the abdomen and extends across to the left side. And you can see it here on the coronal. Now the liver is uh, separated first into a right and a left hepatic lobe. Anatomically, it's separated by the falciform ligament uh, but surgically and radiographically we separate it into right and left lobe based on the middle hepatic vein. So first of all we got to find the hepatic veins. Now the hepatic veins drain into the IVC and so here's the IVC remember dumping into the right atrium going down the IVC is connected to the hepatic veins. So there are three main hepatic veins that drain into the IVC and they are the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and then the left hepatic vein. And for us, it's the middle hepatic vein that separates the liver into a right lobe and then a left lobe, as opposed to the falciform ligament. So next, we're going to take a look at the gallbladder, which lies here along the inferior margin of the liver. And uh, this patient probably had a recent meal because the uh, margins of the gallbladder uh, are a little wrinkled, maybe due to partial emptying after a meal. Uh, from the gallbladder, uh, we go uh, upward into the neck of the gallbladder, and it's then going to empty uh, its content into the cystic duct. Now these are very small structures and can be uh, difficult to see on a CT scan unless they are uh, abnormally enlarged. So here from the neck, we go up into the cystic duct and from here we should go down towards the common bile duct. Okay? And sometimes it's easier if you follow it distally. So the common bile duct uh, should live in the pancreatic head, here it is, and should empty into the third portion of the duodenum, which it does right here. 
So then we can try to follow it retrograde, going back up, common ball dot, common ball dot, common ball dot, there it is. And there it probably connects with the cystic duct in this region. Now you can see this better on uh, the coronal. Uh, and so if we take a look at that, we can see part of the common ball duct right here probably at the ampulla entering the third portion of the duodenum. Here's the pancreatic head. And then it kind of takes a curvilinear route up the pancreas to reach the cystic duct. Now for the pancreatic duct. Uh, the pancreatic duct is very small unless it's dilated for some reason uh, by pathology. And so the pancreatic duct should live in the center of the pancreas. Uh, which runs right here and uh, I don't see it but it should come across entering the common bowel duct uh, most of it and then uh, which then enters into the third portion of the duodenum. Now these structures are uh, easier to see uh, using an MRCP or an ERCP. Now see how easy it is to see the pancreatic duct on this MRCP, which is a type of MRI sequence that highlights the fluid in the ductal system well. The IVC we saw already as it uh, received the hepatic veins and entered into the right atrium. But the IVC, you know, comes from down in the inferior abdomen. Uh, and here it is, continuing down and uh, there's joined by the renal veins and then right here it's very small because it's probably being compressed by the uh, third portion of the duodenum below that again it's bigger and then inferiorly it's formed by the right and left common iliac veins so next up uh, are the retroperitoneal uh, organs and uh, the arterial structures so first up are the kidneys. So we have two kidneys, a right and a left kidney. And uh, we have the hilar region, which contains some fat, and then the vessels going in and out, and the collecting systems. And so you can see here on the coronal that the right kidney is usually located more inferiorly compared to the left one uh, due uh, to the presence of the liver. We can then try to identify the ureters, and they're often fairly easy to see as they're formed. Uh, so here uh, is the left ureter. You see how small it is on the left side. On the right side, uh, it's even smaller and harder to see. And so the renal collecting system is not dilated here. Here's the collecting system on the coronal forming the ureter. And then the ureter, of course, is going to uh, go in fairly down the abdomen. Uh, into the pelvis and into the urinary bladder. And uh, so here we're going to follow it. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. And uh, the left ureter does not have contrast in it yet. It makes it hard to see. Okay, But it's uh, located along the anterior aspect of the psoas muscle and uh, continues down here along the medial aspect of it. And it's going to come around the external iliac artery there and then it's going to dive down into the pelvis go along the pelvic sidewall and uh, then it's going to penetrate medially here and enter the uh, urinary bladder which is decompressed here okay so if there's pathology involved uh, where the renal system is dilated and the collecting system is dilated, it's going to be a lot easier to see. But that's kind of the course of the urinary uh, system and the ureter. Okay. Next are the adrenal glands, um, also known as the suprarenal glands, and so they're going to be above the kidneys. And they're uh, V to Y shaped in configuration. So here on the left side uh, is, uh, here on the left side is the left adrenal gland and you can see it above the kidney here on the coronal plane on the right side also located above the right kidney here it is in the axial plane and so fairly narrow two limbs associated with them 
Next is the pancreas, and we kind of touched on that when we, that when we looked at the uh, collecting system. But uh, the pancreatic tail is over here by the spleen. And from the spleen, uh, it continues medially, pancreatic body continues across the um, portal vein here, around down to the pancreatic head, which is where the common bile duct is, uh, and lying next to the second portion of the duodenum. So this kind of bright structure here is the pancreas. And you can see it here in the coronal plane, pancreas coming across to the pancreatic head. We've already done the duodenum and the colon, so we're going to skip that, and uh, we're going to move on to the vasculature. So we have the thoracic aorta in the lower chest, coming down, going through uh, the hiatus here into the abdomen, and right as it does that, it gives off its first major branch uh, that we're going to identify which is the celiac artery okay so the main celiac trunk here that's that's going to um, split into the common uh, hepatic artery right here and then the splenic artery going to the left that's going to head out to the spleen and uh, that's as far as we're going to take that one. There are a lot of other vessels coming off here uh, that's, that are better seen on CTA, uh, where you have timed it particularly to look at the arteries, uh, but we're going to skip those. Um, so next, after the celiac artery, we're going to go inferiorly. We end up at the superior mesenteric artery. We're going to continue down the abdominal aorta and we're going to get to the renal arteries, left and the right one. And then after that, uh, at the same area, we can identify the renal veins, which we kind of touched on before. But the left renal vein here, uh, kind of a long course. It's got to go often anterior to the abdominal aorta. And then the right renal vein here has a shorter course. And. Uh, Interestingly, this patient has an anatomic variant where one of the renal veins right here goes behind the aorta, so retroaortic portion, and then enters the IVC. So like I said before, the venous structures have a lot of variability to them. All right, so we did the renal arteries here. Then we're going to continue down. And the next branch off is going to be the inferior mesenteric artery. And it's a small branch, so we continue down and right there is where it comes out. There's the inferior mesenteric artery. It's going to head to the left, providing uh, supply to the uh, left part of the colon. And that is it for uh, the retroperitoneum and the arterial structures.